Hi, folks. This is Abel James, and thanks so much for listening. This is the Fat Burning Man Show, where we talk about real food and real results. Today's show is with Leanne Ely, a New York Times bestselling author, certified nutritionist, and the creator of the Saving Dinner series. Leanne is also a bona fide expert in preparing and executing the perfect family dinner. It's always a pleasure talking to a fellow food lover about how much we love food. So this hour just breezes by. And exciting news, Leanne and I will be presenting a free webinar on next Monday, January 14th. And we'll be talking about fat loss, how to prepare delicious foods, secrets food marketers don't want you to know, and tons more. So you can sign up for the webinar in the show notes at fatburningman.com as well as in the right sidebar. So be sure to check that out. It's happening on Monday. All right, so in today's show, Leanne and I cover why duck carcass stew is delicious, how cooking can decrease your risk of an early death by 47%, the 70 mysterious ingredients in a McRib, and why kids today think that potatoes might be cantaloupes. All right, let's go hang out with Leanne. Hi, folks. Today we're here with Leanne Ely, who is a New York Times bestselling author, as well as the creator of the Saving Dinner series. How's it going, Leanne? It's going great. How about you, Abel? I'm doing terrific today. So awesome. you, you just finished up an awesome workout, I hear. I did, and I still look like it. Like I said, I'm very glad this is not being done in a video. <laughs> <laughs> me too, trust me. <laughs> yeah, I know, I, know, I know you've been there too. I have certainly been there. Yeah, whenever I'm interviewed on someone else's show, I assume that it's going to be audio, and then at the last minute, you know, like five minutes before the call, I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> I know, I, I did, this happened to me when I did a, I did a Skype chat with, with uh, CNN, and they, oh, no. I just worked the same thing. I just worked. I said, give me two minutes. And I just like, oh, I, I was still terrible. I mean, with the sweat still on, I was putting lipstick on. So, Oh, no. Yeah. That, yeah, that happens that to me great. all the time, minus the lipstick. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, um, that, so. obviously, <laughs> you, you have a huge following. But for those folks who might not know who you are, why don't you give a quick rundown of how you get into food and, and how you got to be where you are today. Right. Um, well, let's see. A long time ago. Well, no, it really has been a long time. It's actually been 12 years now wow. that um, Saving Dinner has been around. And Saving Dinner came to be because my main goal was uh, helping, trying to help people get families back to the dinner table. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the things that I noticed was that with the absence of the all important shopping list, a lot of times things didn't get done. So I noticed that one, you need a menu plan and two, you also need the shopping list. And so putting those two things together naturally um, just developed this whole menu planning online. And, you know, um, I guess we were the first ones to do that. And, you know, the rest is history. We've certainly got some competition out there right now, but, um, we still are like the very first ones who've done this, wow. and um, we are still working very hard. We have a whole team of people that work hard to put together um, our our meals and our menus. And I'll tell you, it's just it's been such a joy to do. I, I love seeing people get back to the dinner table because there's so much that that um, takes care of just that yeah. simple act of having dinner as a family. Mm -hmm. It's becoming a lost art, isn't it? Yes, it is. Absolutely. And it's really a shame. So it, just, you know, if people aren't already on board with this, what's the difference between sitting around a dinner table and having dinner with your family compared to shoving a greasy burrito down your throat in the front seat of a car? Well, yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, speaking of cortisol levels, <laughs> that's... Kind of stressful <laughs> um, dashboard dining like that. You know? Yeah. But um, um, th there's a lot of different things in there. There's so many different elements that play into it. And I know you have, I'm sure you've got a lot of people who are parents in your audience. Yeah. And, you know, you have to think about if you are only throwing a, a bag of McDonald's or whatever in the back seat of your minivan to your kids. Their dinner conversation is, do you want fries with that? Mm -hmm. you know? Their manners are non-existent because nobody's, one, nobody's watching them, their mouth all open. And two, they're just, you know, they're just p pushing it down their face so they can get to the next thing, you know, soccer practice, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, etc. And I know we all have busy lives, but, you know, we do have the opportunity to say no. We still, we still have that God given opportunity to say no mm -hmm. to quite so many activities. 
And the other, the, everything kind of falls apart when the family dinner is not, shall we say, honored. Yeah. Nutrition's not there. I mean, you talked about the greasy burrito. I talked about the bag of McDonald's. Mm -hmm. That's what happens. Or you're sitting in front of a, a television screen. And again, likewise, just eating something that the Domino's pizza guy knows you by your first name. That's always a sign that something's not quite <laughs> right. Um, you, you know, the, the whole list goes on. Teaching your children how to eat properly at the table is a, a lost art as well. Teaching your children how to set the table, which, which plate is their, um, their bread and butter plate, you know, if you, if you set a full table. Mm -hmm. Uh, just a quick story. A, a woman I know um, was absolutely mortified by the fact that she ate her boss's dinner roll at a at a large banquet. You know, the big round tables that seat like 16 people or whatever. Mm -hmm. She sat down at this table and just thought, oh, Lord. And she was starving. And, and she didn't know which one it was. And she just, you know, it was a 50-50 crapshoot there. <laughs> and she picked the wrong one. And her boss looked at her, giving her the hairy eyeball. And he said, you just ate my dinner roll. Wow. Just for, and you know, so yes, there's implications all the way around the block when we're not doing these things that for generation after generation after generation, everyone's family has done. And suddenly in this generation, you know, where we're digital and connected with iPhones, iPads, et cetera, and yeah games and whatever it is, the kids aren't outside anymore. They're sitting on their butts on the inside. They're eating all this junk food that wasn't available 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And we wonder why we have this epidemic of obesity and, and learning disorders and, and all the rest. It all plays together. Now, would a family dinner table fix that? No, it's not going to fix that totally. But we have an opportunity to kind of buck the cultural tide a little bit mm -hmm. in our families by just sitting down at the dinner table. And obviously, the nutrition is going to be 10 times what you're going to get through any drive through Yeah. And there's, mm -hmm. and, and there's it's such an emotional boost, that time for intimacy and connection among your family and your friends is so important, and it's something that's easily missed. Well, think about it for a minute. You know, I mean, when we you start just thinking about and just kind of deconstruct what is it to sit down and break bread with someone? It's it's a type of communion. It is it's a ritual. It's intimate. It's um, tying up loose heartstrings that might have you know accidentally, you know, you might have said something harsh to your child on on the way to school. You have a, an opportunity to reconnect at the dinner table. As well, and you know, a lot of times we we use instead we use the dinner table as sort of a, a collection plate <laughs> yeah. for backpacks and junk mail and everything else. And if we just stop, and it also it forces us to stop, take a breath, and start and really appreciate all those little butts that are sitting at your table. <laughs> I mean, you know, your little girl has has her seat, your husband has his seat. Everybody has their place at the table, and I think that's very. You know, it, it shows something. It shows this is where we are. This is who we are. And it's an identity in a way. Absolutely. So if someone's listening out there and they've decided, okay, this year, it's, it's the new year. I'm going to try to do this right. I'm going to make this a habit. Mm -hmm. and, and part of the nightly ritual will eat dinner at a table. Um, say they want to do that. They've already committed. How in the world do you convince the rest of your family, all of your kids and your husband and whoever else might be there, that this is a good idea for them too? A family meeting is, is really, I mean, you know, you have a democratic process a little bit, a little bit. It's still a bit. I always say that parenthood is a benevolent dictatorship, but you do need to let everybody know what's going on. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times with, and I, and I can say this because I'm a woman, but a lot of times with women, we get this all, this idea in our heads okay, this is what we're going to do. This is going to improve our family dynamics. This is going to be good for the family. We're going to eat better. We're going to save money. I mean, the list goes on of all the benefits on why this is happening. And then you don't tell anybody and expect everybody to fall in line with the program that you've got in your head. Sure. So, <laughs> um, so we need to really let everybody know and bring, bring them aboard. And I think the first person that you need to talk to is your partner and just say, you know, gee, I'm really convinced that this would be a really good, healthy thing for us as a family. These are the reasons why. 
and make sure you get the gung ho. Yeah, let's do this from your spouse. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, um, it, you know, you can start getting into some dangerous territory and have mutiny like nobody's seen to sit everybody down. I, I think that's also, it's a really important thing. Otherwise you're kind of pulling a power play yeah. by sitting the family down and everybody's going, what's going on? And then you announce, you know, like you're, you're Captain Bly or something. <laughs> this yeah. is what's going to happen. <laughs> I, I think this is a real mistake. So if you get, especially if you get your spouse together, you can sit down together and say, we as a family are going to do X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And we're going to try to improve our diet and we're going to, you know, fill in the blank. Yeah. Um, and it just, it's interesting what happens. There, there's, um, kids really respond. They feel more secure. They, there's, there's study after study after study showing that children are less likely to have an eating disorder if they eat at the family dinner table. They're, mm -hmm. they're more likely to do better in school. They're less likely to do drugs. They're less likely to, um, do have promiscuous sex as, as teenagers. The list goes on. There's amazing things that happen when that dynamic, you know, that vacuum, I guess, is filled. And that, that family dynamic at the dinner table is so critically important. Absolutely. And so what do you actually do if people are really not used to it? And I think there are a lot of folks out there that we can all be right. guilty of this at, at some point. But you finally get everyone to sit down for the first time in God knows how many uh, weeks or months since the last time you had a dinner like that. Uh, the food is served. And then what do you do? with your time, what is the, the perfect dinner for a family to have together? Well, first of all, I think it's really important that you don't have unrealistic expectations and it suddenly expect Norman Rockwell, you know, <laughs> perfection at the table. Mm -hmm. the child is still going to eat with their mouth full. They're still going to turn up their nose at the Brussels sprouts. They're still going to have, you know, he said, she said, mom, get his hands off me, yada, yada, yada. It's still going to happen. Yeah. You know, the you know what's going to be hitting the fan, and I, I think the most important thing, one of the, my one of the biggest things that I learned as a parent, my kids are now in their early twenties, and one of the most important things that I learned was if I kept my cool, everybody else did. Yeah. So you know you're setting sort of the temperature, if you will, of the room, and just let everybody know. Okay, you know what, game. These are the rules. This is this is how it's going to be at the at the dinner table. If you guys need to go outside and deck each other, you can do that in the backyard after dinner. But for right now, keep your hands to yourself. <laughs> and you just kind of go through and give a few rules. And I think it's important to keep it simple, too. Because if you start saying, okay, close your mouth, do this, get your hands off the table, blah, blah, blah. And you just are like this, you know, sergeant mm -hmm. <laughs> at boot camp. Nobody's going to want your program. Yeah, you know? They're going to say, mom's just... A jerk, and I really don't want to be. You know, I just want to get this dinner time crap over. With. <laughs> I don't want to say that, but you know, they'll be thinking it. <laughs> so, how do you make it fun then? Uh, well, you just if you let them know ahead of time. You know, we're going to sit at the table, and, and you know, instead of doing rigid stuff, it's just you know, find one interesting thing. Tell them in the morning. I want one really interesting thing. That's appropriate. No bathroom humor. Mm -hmm. um, that you are either like a funny joke or something somebody did or whatever from school, and then you know we we everybody gets a chance to go around the table and say just one interesting thing. Yeah. You know, and and, and it doesn't there there doesn't need to be anything. You know, it doesn't have to be a red letter moment every time. Sure. Sometimes you know somebody will say, "Yeah, it was really interesting." Little Johnny threw up all over me. <laughs> in gym today. Oh, well, thank you for sharing. That's very uh, nice. nice. Next. At the table. Yes. <laughs> but, you know, kids, this is how kids learn. I believe mean, generation after generation, we've learned by being corrected. Mm -hmm. and it's okay to correct your kids. Just don't overcorrect and don't make them feel like <laughs> there's nothing I can do right to make this woman happy. You know, yeah. She's constantly on me. Yeah. <laughs> now, what about uh, if the kids are picky at the table? Picky is an interesting thing. You know, I had a, a seven-year-old um, son at the time. He was seven years old. And my kids, I've been very blessed because very conscientious eater myself. When I found out I was pregnant, I was a horrible vegetable eater. And I determined that if I didn't eat vegetables, my kids wouldn't either. So mm -hmm. I decided I'm going to be a good veggie eater. And I, you know, taught myself to like vegetables. I also realized, 
you know, I hope my mom's not listening, but she knows she ever cooked the ever loving daylights out of every single vegetable that went onto our table. So I've learned that if you didn't overcook them and there's lots of different cooking methods, they can be quite tasty. And yeah. so I started to enjoy vegetables. So my kids were good vegetable eaters, but I couldn't break through on the salad thing with my son. And I was trying and still do to this day, trying to do a, a fresh green salad with every meal, lots of different stuff in it. You wouldn't touch it. No, I don't like it. And you just, I mean, meltdown at the table. And I'm like, finally, I just thought, hmm, what am I going to do here? Yeah. Well, each, each day, my children, Monday and Wednesday was my daughter's day to help in the kitchen. And Tuesday and Thursday were my son's days to help in the kitchen. They got to be my helpers. I got them little aprons from uh, Walmart had them and you could use paint pens on them and they decorated them up, put them on hooks in the, in the broom closet. So they take their apron out and we had a whole ritual that went with it. And that's really good for a lot of parents who might be listening right now. Rituals are important for kids. That's one of the reasons why the dinner table is important, mm -hmm. but also helping in the kitchen is not just a, a good learning experience. It's an important ritual as well. They understand that there are things that you need to do. Go get your little stool, put on your apron, go wash your hands. And that was our little thing. So Peter went and he put on his apron got his little stool, he washed his hands, and he looked at me, what are we going to do now? <laughs> and I said, today, you're going to make a salad. He looked horrified. Yeah. He said, he said well, what do, what do I have to do for that? And I said, anything you want. And I said, well, you know, where we keep everything, all the salad stuff. So he went to the crisper, and he pulled out everything, and he destroyed my kitchen. <laughs> destroyed. But I didn't say a word. And at that dinner table that night, I'm not kidding you, he ate three helpings of that salad, and every five minutes, hey, Dad, what do you think of my salad? Mom, good salad. You think it's a good uh -huh. salad? I made that salad. So from there, that was a big learning experience for me, and I always tell my listeners the same thing. Hands-on nutrition is about preparing the food. It's about buying the food. It's even about growing the food. Yeah. When, there's, when there's involvement in it and you, there's something that you can do with it, there's a whole shift that happens. I mean, it happens with all of us. You, if you've ever grown a homemade tomato, I mean, you act like you have just grown the first tomato ever mm -hmm. in the whole world. And you're just, look at everybody, look at my tomato. And I, you know, you're not sure when you want to eat it because if you eat it, then your first tomato is gone. You know? <laughs> right. You know, you're looking at it and holding it to the heavens and, and just bowing to it practically. So that's the whole thing that comes with getting picky eaters eating. And then... You know, obviously, it's one of the things, and not everybody's just going to, you know, conform as quickly as, as my son did. I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that he knew I wasn't kidding around. We're going to eat this. Yeah. And it's about holding the line a little bit and realizing that if your child does make the decision that he's not going to eat, even after, you know, a nice coercion out of you um, to just at least try it. I always say that that persistence is, is the one who's going to win. Persistence will win. And it's either going to be your child's persistence or you. Yeah. And it's you have to decide who wears the mommy pants and mm -hmm. who doesn't. And when you understand, too, that your child understands that there is no other food available if they choose not to eat that. In other words, he will train you if he can to make him a peanut butter sandwich if he decides he doesn't want to eat the evening meal. Right. Or you could be a short order cook and be making, you know, the dumbed down food, which drives me crazy, or kids' meals, mm -hmm. you know, chicken nuggets and mm, mac and cheese. Nice or, oh, mac and yeah. cheese. You it's know, the worst. It's not only that, but it's also, it's, it is, this is going to, this is going to be blow you away a little bit, but I feel like it's like saying to a kid, I don't trust you enough to eat real good food. I'm going to give you this crap <laughs> because you you and all of your little minions aren't worthy of real food because you do, you don't have the palate. Well, guess what? The palate's got to be trained. Yeah. You know, when you first started working out with weights, I mean, did you just go into and say, "Yeah, I'm just going to bench 300 pounds today." <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work that way. No, that's how you Perfect. blow out knees and wreck your shoulders and all that junk. 
Exactly. And that's how it is with kids. I mean, just because mm-hmm. they hate zucchini the first time, they might like it the seventh time. Just keep on it. Yeah. And that reminds me about what you were saying before, too, about it's how important it is to have a connection with food, a positive connection, and seeing it from uh, the beginning to the end. I remember my my dad throughout the uh, – he was always a big cook, and he cooked his way through college to pay his way through. And so he always loved cooking. And um, when it came to be that time of the season, we'd go out in the backyard and grab parsnips. And we couldn't wait to bring them inside when we were little kids and cut them up. Um, well, rinse the dirt off first, cut them up, throw them in a bunch of butter and, and cook them up. And we just eat them by themselves. And oh, yeah. that's such like a, a positive memory that is still so salient in my mind. But you think about what's happening today and, and you just won't have that with macaroni, with Easy Mac or Annie's macaroni and cheese or whatever. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not at all the same thing. It's not at all the same thing. And the, the other thing that, you know, if you think about food for a minute, it is one of the most joyful connections that we have as people. It's how we, every momentous occasion in life is celebrated with food. Mm-hmm. We have a, uh, there's a wedding, there's a feast afterwards, for heaven's sakes, a feast. I love feasts. There is, it, yeah, there's, there's a birthday party. Guess what? You're going to eat not just cake, but there's going to be a dinner and all this other stuff. And even at a funeral, there's food. Mm-hmm. We mark important occasions with food all the time. And I'm here to say that every meal is an important occasion. And it's also an opportunity to get the nutrient dense foods into our bodies that we need. We know what the statistics are with, with chronic health conditions. They're just spiraling out of control. And a lot of it is connected intimately and, and directly with the quality of the food that we're eating. Absolutely. So what's your take on, on quality food? Well, you know, I hate to be like this, and, and I, I, I've been doing this for a lot of years, um, 12 years we've had the website, but previous to that, you know, as a nutritional consultant, I went around to nursery schools and, and helped start a number of organic produce co-ops, and um, I really, you know, I, I always said to people, if you can afford it, get, get it going. I mean, mm-hmm. this is years and years ago. Organics gotten a lot more expensive and a lot more available. Yep. And I hate to say it, but I follow pretty much that to the letter. I, I eat almost 100% organically. And yes, it costs more. There's ways of alleviating some of that um, cost sure. by having your own garden. I mean, you can make your own salad bowl, for heaven's sakes, mm-hmm. and, and keep it going and, and it costs pretty much nothing. And anybody can do it. If, even if you're in a high rise in Chicago somewhere, you can do it if you've got a window. Mm-hmm. You know? it's, yeah. it's that simple. But I, I do think that we have to be aware of what has happened to um, bioagriculture. Uh, the GMO food crisis, I think, is exactly that. It's a crisis all over the world. People are saying no to our GMO products from mm-hmm. Monsanto and, and DuPont. Um, there's, there's a lot of health issues that are connected with them. There's a lot of problems, and we need to know where our food comes from. Yeah. And if our government's not going to tell us that, then we need to know ourselves and grow what we can. And I hate to say, you know, Little House on the Prairie, go back to, you know, get rid of your green lawn and go put in, you know, <laughs> a gigantic garden. But there are ways of, of putting in garden stuff. There's ways of supporting people um, that are doing wonderful things at farmer's markets Um, there's a fantastic website. I don't know if you know about this. It's called Mm localharvest.org. You should write that one down because you can type your zip code in and you can find all kinds of organic produce, even from somebody's backyard. That is so cool. Isn't it? And you can get grass fed beef that way. You know, you can do, get little backyard chicken eggs and all kinds of stuff. And I love supporting the local economy. I think it's neat. And you meet the most interesting people. You sure do. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Every time I go to the farmer's market, it makes me smile seeing how crazy some of the people who raise my food are. Oh, I know. (laughs) They're eccentrics. It's great. I love it. (laughs) Well, what you said too, uh, so for the holidays, my girlfriend and dog and I drove out to California from Texas. So it was a long drive. And we were just in a little hatchback, not the RV this time. So it was, uh, we couldn't cook our whole way like we did last time. So we had to stop and try to get food at different places. And it is almost impossible to find something that I would even like reasonably want to put into my body 
when you're on a road trip like that. I understand completely. And you know what? Your last email too, Abel, I read, and that Cambridge study was fascinating. Isn't it? it? Oh my gosh. Yes. Yeah, so, 47% of people, um, what was it? I don't know the exact stats. So yeah, um, basically they looked at people over 10 years and measured the amount that they cooked. And for the people who cooked, uh, I think it was five or more times more a times. week compared to the non cookers, they had a 47% chance that they were more likely to be alive than the non cookers. I mean, that is shocking. <laughs> but it makes sense. Yeah. Because it does. Okay, go to a restaurant for a minute. Just think about this from also the cost of the whole thing. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, you are paying basically, um, 70 cents more per dollar, uh, for gross, for restaurant food than you are at home. Yeah. So if you think about it, you're paying all that money and you're getting such little nutrition, even in like chain restaurants where they have, this is the recipe, this is how we do it. This is whatever, you know, you've got a, you need a huge latitude for human error behind there. Mm -hmm. Plus they salt the ever loving, you know, what out of everything they do. And who knows what they're really adding to all of that stuff. So I just, I'm really very, very persnickety when it comes. I mean, we'll go out for sushi because that's one of my, that's one of my, uh, you know, food crushes. I love sushi. Oh yeah, good but, sushi. And I don't sushi. make it at home. I'm not a good sushi chef. <laughs> yeah. that's, a, that's a confession right there. <laughs> I think you could admit that. That's that's a tough one. Is that okay? All right. Yeah, that's fine. I, I won't dock you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that reminds me actually. When we were on that trip, I was looking for you know. The, the easy, quick ones, if you're just popping into a gas station, which normally I would suggest that people don't eat anything, right. but I'd already like been fasting for the day before that. And so I needed something. I got hard boiled eggs and I was looking for um, jerky and there were probably 20 different kinds of jerky and half of them contained MSG. And the ones that said that they did not contain MSG That's actually awesome. contained MSG also, because <laughs> I know how to read the ingredients. You know, there's like a laundry list of 20 different uh, things that don't appear to be MSG but actually contain free glutamate, which is uh, something that you don't want to put in your body. So it was just, oh, it was so frustrating and hopeless when you go to a place like that, which is just another reason we always make road trip cookies, which sounds like it would be a delectable dessert, but usually they're actually packed with protein, made with, with eggs and real foods, and that's a great kind of road trip type thing. Um, a lot better than a greasy burrito in the front seat anyway. <laughs> I, I will tell you, and I, I feel your pain. I, I really, when I travel, and I travel, you know, I travel usually once a month or mm-hmm. pretty much it seems to average about once a month. And I have a little backpack that I always, I put in um, turkey jerky that I get from Trader Joe's, which mm-hmm. is fantastic, and nitrate free as well as MSG free. And I put in um, all kinds of, of nuts. And I have, um, I bring my protein and a shaker bottle. And I mean, it's just, that's all you can do. Yeah. You know? It's all you can do because, I mean, I'm sitting there in an airport going, what on earth am I going to eat here? <laughs> so I did have a worst. really good meal one time at breakfast. I had, they had poached eggs and, and apple wood bacon. And they gave me a salad on the side. I was like, I was wow. like, no, but this is fantastic. I'll eat that. <laughs> that never happens. Never. I know. This is, <laughs> this is at a bar in an airport. Wow. How about that? Yeah, weird, huh? <laughs> so I was reading up on, on your eating style, and I, I believe you called it part-time paleo. Is that what it is? It is part-time paleo, <laughs> yep. So what does that mean to you? That means that sometimes I stick my toe in the dairy pool. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, me too. I, I, I will tell you one of my favorite things. Well, I mean, I'm, I don't miss beans, mm-hmm. even though I make a terrific chili and, and all of that. And I'll still make it, you know, for my husband. But beans, I always had, you know, I mean, I didn't have like, it, it wasn't, you know, like I'm telling you tor- horrible gas stories or anything. Yeah. But I, I made my stomach feel sick. Mm-hmm. And it made my, my time feel really bloated. And I just didn't feel, it didn't make me feel good. Yeah. I kept thinking, well, you know, it's so good for you, all that fiber, all that, you know, but, you know, the truth of the matter is beans are full of lectins and Mm -hmm. lectins are poisons to keep the, keep the critters from eating them so that they can, you know, continue to propagate. But, um, some people do fine with them. Some people don't, If, if in a, I guess in the whole paleo world, they would have them sprouted first. Sure. 
But I'm not about to sprout a bunch of beans. I'm sorry. I mean, <laughs> I've got enough on my plate. <laughs> I'm doing enough. I can really I do want that. To. I'll just stay away from them. They cause me problems. Who cares? Yeah. I'm really, really happy when I have. I'm on a fish kick right now, which makes me think I'm, you know, probably need the iodine and probably need whatever nutrients are there. But I just kind of follow what it is that my body's craving. Yeah. And um, I've been eating fish chowder. My husband looked at me and he said, if you make another fish chowder, I think it's like to the moon, Alice, kind of a thing. He's just <laughs> like, no more. I'm tired of it. But I, I um, use coconut cream yeah. in there instead of the dairy. And you know, I, I'm like a ghee queen. I have ghee. I've got jars of it. I buy it, you know, on Amazon.com because they have grass-fed ghee that's just fantastic. Yeah, they have good stuff. Oh, I love it. And so my my whole thing is, but here's here's the kicker. If I'm getting ready for this, I make a minestrone soup, no pasta, no beans, but tons of vegetables. I make a fantastic bone broth and lots of seasoning and it just, oh, and garlic for days. Mm -hmm. And of course, massive amounts of onions. And I'm sitting there and thinking, what is this missing? It's not the pasta that I miss. It's not the beans that I miss. It's that Parmesan over the top. Uh -huh. So I will, that's my, that's my little part-time part where yeah. I will say no to the pasta, no to the beans, but give me that Parmesan. And I just make a rule that I use. Um, it has to be aged at least 120 days. Mm -hmm. And you know why you do the same thing, Abel, right? Because that's that it helps to break down the lactose and makes it a whole lot more digestible, and the flavor is 350 times better. Yeah. And I just put just a little tablespoon over the top of that, and I am one happy camper. That sounds. That's making me hungry a little bit, actually. I'm looking. <laughs> <laughs> I've got it in my crock pot right now, and I'm smelling it. That's why. I, I said <laughs> Lucky you. Yeah, we just, on Sundays, what I tend to do, and did it yesterday too, is take everything that, you know, is in that like two to three day realm where it's yes. <laughs> it's, it's going to get fishy soon, but yeah. you know that it's still good food and you, you want to eat it. And I throw all of that stuff into a big stew. And so I put yeah. that on the crock pot all day and it came out great. I, I even put weird stuff in there. I called it a duck carcass stew. Um, <laughs> which doesn't sound that appetizing, but <laughs> no, it sounds wonderful to me. I love that stuff. It was fantastic, and making a crock pot food is that's just ideal. You know, being a man, it's uh, you don't always want to be in the kitchen all the time. I'm sure women don't either, but you know, at least <laughs> I remember when I went to college, my parents gave me a cookbook that was. What was it? A, a man, a can, man, and, a can and a plan. Have you have yeah. you seen that? I have seen it. Yes. <laughs> oh Lord! So there's still, I guess, a piece of that 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 lives on within me somehow. <laughs> well, I can tell you though, I think I think crock pots are one of the most incredible accessories in mm -hmm. the kitchen that that a person could possibly have. Mine is always going because I always have some kind of a bone broth going on. I have some kind of a stew that I'm making, whatever it is. I mean, I'm, there's always an opportunity to keep that thing humming. Yeah. I'm even thinking I might get another one, but you know, it, there's no reason why we can't cook when we have a crock pot. Really. You just have to remember to throw it in. You pretty, yeah. You pretty much just dump a bunch of stuff in there. You just, that's what I do. I unload my fridge at the end of the week. Yeah, I guess you, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and it's amazing. I, it, it comes out. I was with, um, um, my girlfriend and a friend last night who came over um, and stayed for dinner. We were watching the football game and he just stayed. And he usually doesn't eat all the weird stuff that, you know, Allison and I eat. And so, um, unbeknownst to him, he was eating beef liver, duck carcass, and <laughs> turmeric, and all this crazy stuff. And he's like, wow, this is, this is pretty good. I like this. I know. It's funny. People, people think that you just eat so weird and then they realize, wow, this is just really good. You can, I had a girlfriend come over and I made, I was just in a big hurry. She, she and I were talking, and I said, let me just make dinner really quick. And I had, there's a, a Orca Bay. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's a fantastic company that puts together wild fish. So you get cod, um, salmon, haddock, name that tune. They have all this wild wow. flounder, all these wild fish, and they put them, seal them in just, you know, one serving piece size and put them in a great big bag. So you pull those out, throw them in the sink, let them thaw, and get everything ready. And I sautéed up these salmon. It was wild sockeye salmon. And I just sautéed it in ghee, put it
put a little bit of, of um, curry powder over the top. And then when the fish was done, and then in the meantime, I sauteed up some, I had some baby greens. I had baby char, baby kale, and I guess some spinach was in it. It was really good. Wow. Sauteed that with some garlic and ghee. Okay, here comes the ghee again, right? <laughs> and when I finished the salmon, I took some coconut milk and deglazed the pan for just a minute. Mm. But it made a delicious sauce. And she said, oh, my gosh, this is like a restaurant. It took me 10 minutes to make that meal. That's Ten amazing. minutes. And now I'm famished. Thanks for that. <laughs> What's that? I said, now I'm famished. Thanks for that. <laughs> yeah. It's good stuff. Well, yeah, it is amazing. It doesn't, there's no reason that you need to be in the kitchen for three hours to make something amazing when the food starts off fresh and whole. Oh, amen to that. Yeah. And I think that's, that's part of the whole thing is, is, um, you know, first of all, I say always, I want to get the family back to the dinner table, but I also want to get the family to appreciate real food and to really, to get away, you know, step away from the box, step away from all this convenient stuff. Um, and you don't need to buy a rotisserie chicken either. It's really super simple to make a roast chicken. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a lost art, I think somewhat of, of people, but I think it's on a revival of, mm -hmm. of people starting to get back into the kitchen, starting to cook again. Well, just because the world out there is getting so wacky. <laughs> it is. It's frightening. Yeah, so. it, it, it is. I don't, I don't like it at all. I'm just, I, it makes me nervous watching all of this stuff and, you know, watching all these kids. I just feel like I, I see these young, and I sound like an old lady when I say this, but I mean, I see these young women who they're in supposedly in their prime and their bodies are just gone. Mm -hmm. You know, they've, they've, uh, it just makes me sad. Yeah, it is tough. Well, when you think about our childhoods and we're from slightly different generations, but right. it, it was hard enough to be healthy then and it's hard enough now, but it's, it's not getting easier is the problem. Right. Um, well, I, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm definitely just a little bit older than you, Abel, but I will tell you that, that, um, you know, my generation, there was a computer, no, nothing. And we went outside to play, came mm -hmm. in when the streetlights were on and, um, you know, we were expected to help with the dinner, help clean the dishes and do all that. And it was just old fashioned values. And yeah. now it seems antiquated and ancient and, you know, those things worked and there's a reason why. For generation after generation after generation, families did the same thing because it worked. It, it produced successful adults. And that's all we're all trying to do is we're trying to take with our children, we're trying to raise successful adults. Motherhood is the only job that you want to work yourself out of a job. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants their 30-year-old kid living at home in the basement. <laughs> right. you know? No, thank you. You want to have on your own. And this is, this is one of the ways that you teach for success because eating well, and when I say eating well, meaning that you know how to cook, mm -hmm. you know how to go to the grocery store and identify certain vegetables, you know how to pick a good one, you know how to bring them home, prepare them, and not have them rot in your crisper. Yeah. That's a, that's a life skill. Right. It really is. It and, is. And if you don't have that life skill then you're at the mercy of everyone else. I don't know about you, but I don't like being at anyone's mercy. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and for those of you, we were talking about this a little bit earlier, but if you're not on my newsletter, I was basically what I said is that I, I've realized this year what the one secret is to being lean and healthy for life, and it's not about carb cycling or macronutrient ratios or any nonsense like that. It's about learning how to cook. Mm -hmm. uh, because when you know how to cook and... Uh, you're dedicated to getting the highest quality ingredients. You're superhuman. There's no reason that you'd want to go out to a crappy restaurant because it's just not acceptable anymore. Um, and so if you look at the people who are actually having success with being healthy over the course of their life, they know how to make eggs and it doesn't have to be complicated, you know, but they, they know how to use a crock pot. You can make eggs, you can make a simple roast. And, uh, and I really think that that's the secret to being healthy, not only yourself, but your whole family as well. Absolutely. And you know what? It, it's, it's interesting. It's caught. It's not taught. It's taught somewhat, but it is a, it's one of those things that's caught. I grew up in a home where my mother was a good, you know, regular 
meat and potatoes kind of a cook, you know, and I said, we did have vegetables. Like I said, they were just a little on the overcooked side, (laughs) but she was a good cook. Nonetheless, my dad was a crazy man. He was, um, an Englishman and his idea of cooking was, you know, get out the fire extinguisher. Dad's cooking. (laughs) So I'm serious. He, he, He loved all the ethnic stuff and he'd take me when I was a little girl, we'd go down to these ethnic markets down in Los Angeles and, and he'd bring, you know, and I'm like, what the heck? And I mean, I learned to eat frog legs when I was about five years old Wow! because he was, you know, he made them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I thought that was terrific. So, you know, exposure is, you know, one of my, my friend JJ always says exposure equals preference. And she's absolutely right. And mm-hmm. if, if we expose our children to a lot of different flavors and tastes and what have you, and, and keeping in mind what their tastes are and making sure too, that we always have something on their plate that they like. Yeah. Um, then I think we can win the battle of the picky eater. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting too, because like you said, things are learned and it's based upon exposure over the course of your life. But if you, if you think about eating liver, which most people would assume to be gross, it didn't used to be, it used to be, you know, a delicacy, even a generation or two ago. Um, but now, uh, you know, <laughs> if my friends come over and I'm just like, oh, we're having liver tonight. They'll be like, what? <laughs> um, but if you think about that, like eating liver compared to eating a fish stick or like a hot dog or a sausage, you know, like which one is grosser? <laughs> like, which one is more disgusting? I'm going to go with the, whatever the heck is in that hot dog, you know? Oh yeah. Or the dog food that they serve at Taco Bell. I mean, Lord knows what's in that stuff. <laughs> I don't, I don't even want to say. Well, I just did. There's a thing on my on my um, Facebook. You should go take a look at. I just posted that I found um, online about the 70 different ingredients in a McRib sandwich. Oh, I bet that's. Oh man, it'll make you hurl. I'm telling you, it's 70? really bad. It's re- and you think you think why would anybody eat this? Yeah. Why? But it's it's a weird thing because I, I um, you're, you're familiar of course with Jamie Oliver and he's done that whole food revolution thing. Mm-hmm. Anyway, he had this show on. I don't know if you saw it, but he was showing a bunch of kindergartners. Um, he asked them, you know, would you eat the the? They all liked the chicken nuggets, and he was showing them how chicken nuggets were made. Yuck! I mean, literally showing them. He had this disgusting chicken. He took off all on the chicken, the cooked chicken, he pulled all the skin out and all the sinews and all the, the icky stuff. And he pushed it through and he added a bunch of stuff to, and made them into chicken patties. And then he asked the kids, how many people would eat this? And they all shot their hands up. They didn't care. It looked like a chicken, you know, chicken thing. Really? Isn't that sickening? That is interesting. <laughs> and all of these kids, they, he went around the room too, and he had like he was holding up a tomato, and he asked, "Who, who knows what this is?" Yeah. And there was like one kid in the room who knew it was a tomato. Yeah, I've seen videos like that. I love watching documentaries, especially about food, and they're hilarious and terrifying and depressing when you when you see that you know someone walks in with a potato and they ask a room full of kids, "What is this?" And they're like, "Cantaloupe." <laughs> 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 It's hilarious, but it's so sad. It is sad. It is sad. And, I, you know, that I guess that's kind of my the clarion call, I would say, for and my mission is to make sure that we don't lose this because it's so important, not just for, you know, the, the closeness of our family, but also just, I think, just for the continuation of the species, for heaven's sake. Yeah, absolutely. You know, look at the look at the infertility rates that have gone skyrocketed out of control. Mm-hmm. And why is this happening? And this polycystic ovarian syndrome, I, n- I never heard about that until about 10 years ago. Maybe it's right. been around for a lot longer. But all of these things, if, if we just take our food and we start to make a connect the dots kind of a... Um, a decision. And we understand that, you know, we do this with data, right? Mm-hmm. Garbage in, garbage out. We yep. do this all the time. Why can't we connect the, the dots with poor health equals poor food choices or poor food cho- choices equals poor health? Right. It's, it's pretty darn simple. And we have to go back to the dinner table. We need to, you know, fire up that big thing in the kitchen called the stove and use it. Yeah, now, Absolutely. 
I always say that the, the kitchen is the place where you store the large appliances. They need to also be used yeah. in a loving <laughs> manner, and it doesn't have to be hard. Yeah. One of the worst things I've ever heard, and it's repeated over and over again, and many doctors say this, is that diet has nothing to do with X, Y, Z condition. You know, you start screaming and I'll join you. <laughs> <laughs> it just drives me crazy. I mean, it's, it, it's insane. If you take a step back, like garbage in, garbage out, just think about it. I mean, how could it have nothing to do with nutrition? It has everything to do with what you put in your body. What happens to your body is based upon what you feed it, you know, right. and what you don't feed it, what it's missing and all the junk that you're putting in it, all the toxins, as well as what you do with it, moving around, um, you exercise, you know what that does, not just for your body, but for your mind. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it absolutely, you know, all of these things, these are, these are lifestyle choices that we make. Um, it's not just, I'm going to have, you know, five weeks, I'm going to blitz and, you know, get the weight off from Christmas. I'm five weeks, I'm going to just do all of this and then go back to your, you know, merry little ways. Mm -hmm. we, we have to make a, a very, we have to have a, this whole shift in our thinking and understand that in order to be, you know, a successful senior citizen, if you will, um, then we need to start planning for that now. Yeah. And that's not far off. I mean, they say it takes at least 30 years for Alzheimer's to develop. Mm -hmm. So if you have an 80 year old with Alzheimer's, that means at 50, they were starting the descent. Yeah. Well, you that's know, shocking, isn't it? It is shocking. And, and th those are the, that's, that's kind of the playground we need to, to play in mm -hmm. and understand that, you know, my mother-in-law fell down and, um, we were, this is a while ago, a couple of years ago, and we were in the mountains and, you know, looking at the view and everything, she fell down and she could not get herself back up. And I thought to myself, oh, wow, that's what happens when you lose your upper body strength. Mm -hmm. And not that she can't recover that. But wouldn't it be better to to have it and to maintain it, mm -hmm. not have to worry about falling down and not being able to get back up? Right. So. Anyway. Yeah. It's all about those healthy habits and uh, and making sure that you <laughs> you stay on the right track for the long term. Well, yeah. There's there's a uh, life is short. I mean, it, I, that's that's no newsflash. I mean, every we all say that. We all think that. But what I, what has been very noticeable, and you know, I'm having these discussions with with uh, my parents. Um, my mom is the only one still alive, and my husband's parents, you know, in their 80s, and we're having these discussions about how do you want to be cared for? Mm -hmm. Should you need to be cared for later on in life? And the fact is that most elderly people need some kind of care. It's it's the it's the rare senior that is over, you know, whatever age and living on their own successfully. Yeah. And they still get around and able to still do Well, I want to be that one. I want to be that rare person. You and will. it's not like I'm living for when I'm 80. Believe me, that's not the case <laughs> at all. But I want, I want to get as much juice out of this life as I possibly can. I'm yeah. doing it right now and it's going to pay off later too. When I'm old and everybody you know, all these whippersnappers, 75 year old <laughs> whippersnappers are saying, Hey, Hey lady, can you help me out? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Hey, me for a ride down to the grocery store. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. And you're helping so many other people do it uh, at the same time. We're just about out of time, but why don't you tell folks out there uh, what you're working on now and where they can find you? Well, Oh, I'm working on a lot of stuff right now. Um, no, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> We've got, we've got a lot of really cool stuff going on. Um, I'm just signed with Plume, which is a subsidiary of um, an imprint, actually, of Penguin for a new book called Part-Time Paleo. Oh, right. Uh, how, to go how to go paleo without going crazy. And um, that's just based on my own experience, yeah. <laughs> as you can tell from our <laughs> previous conversation. Right. But, you can find me at savingdinner.com and we are, you know, if you sign up for our newsletter, you'll get a free menu sent to you for the week. Um, we have all kinds of good stuff there. You're welcome to take a look around and read our blog posts and what have you. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Leanne. I'm, I know that we'll be talking again soon. That's great. Thank you, Abel. All right. Cheers.
If you'd like to hear more from Leanne Ely, you can check out her website at savingdinner.com. And don't forget to sign up for our free webinar coming up on this Monday, January 14th. You can sign up at fatburningman.com in Leanne's show notes or on the right sidebar. Plenty of fun guests coming up. Mark Sisson, Lauren Cordain, just to name a few. So stay tuned and I'll be talking to you guys soon. Cheers.